let's pray as we begin. Father, in the name of Jesus, let this not just be another series. Father, let our lives be transformed. Father, we ask for deliverance. Let strong goals be destroyed. Let light shine on our hearts. Father, break the hold of scarcity by reason of the teaching and the preaching of your word in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, and we worship you. For in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Mrs. Miriam Wise um, is the special advisor to Nigeria's president on social protection. On the 18th of January 2018, she said, and I quote, 67% of Nigeria's population lives below the poverty line. 67% of the Nigerian population, 67% of the Nigerian population lives below the poverty line. If she's the special advisor to the president on social protection, she should know what she's saying. Punch newspapers on the 26th of June, 2018, uh, published a report. And I want to quote a part of that report to you tonight. They said that Nigeria has emerged as the country with the highest number of poor people in the world, overtaking India. It continues. The report says, according to a report by the Brookings Institution, data from the World Poverty Clock shows that Nigeria now has over 87 million people living in poverty. Over 87 million people living in poverty. As a matter of fact, our own Institute for Statistics, I can't remember the, their name now, in 2016 actually said we had about 112 million people living in poverty. Okay? The report adds that six Nigerians become poor every minute. Six Nigerians become poor every minute. So for the sake of understanding, we should ask ourselves, what does it mean to be poor? Okay? If 67% of Nigerians, over 87 million people are poor, what does it mean to be poor? According to the United Nations, you are poor if you live with um, an income of less than $1.9 per day. Okay? If you take what you earn and you break it down and you earn less or you live on less than $1.9 in a day, then you are poor, okay? At 360 Naira to a dollar, that's 684 Naira. If you live on less than 684 Naira in a day, according to the United Nations, you are poor. So what's our objective in this series? Our objective is to find perhaps if there is a connection between our faith in God and our finances. Okay, we are Christians. We are believers. Is there a connection between being a Christian, okay, and your financial condition, all right? And for today's message, I want to particularly focus on breaking the hold of scarcity. And I've chosen to use the word scarcity, not poverty, because at Hill City, apparently we are within the 23% that are not poor. What they did not say is that those 23 or thereabout percent are rich. So you see, I don't know about you, how many of us can use some extra cash? So you might not even be poor, but for a lot of Nigerians who are even not in the 67 percent, things are scarce. Do you understand? So for our purpose, and because we are, you know, we are Christians, we are positive people, uh, let's use the word scarcity. Hello? So, can, is it possible for a person to make up his or her mind to break free from scarcity? I believe so. And that's what we want to look into tonight. Hallelujah. Now, there are three dimensions to scarcity. In other words, when you see people, what does it mean to, to have scarcity? It simply means to desire something and not to be able to have it. That's scarcity. So, I'm talking to people, some of us, rent is due, okay, and you don't have money. Okay, some of us, we desire, you know, things and we just can't afford it. Let me say this to you. When you look at Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 in the Garden of Eden, the way God designed us to live, we were not supposed to have scarcity. As a matter of fact, when you look at the life of Adam, you would notice that everything Adam required for life on earth was available in the garden before Adam showed up. So Adam did not have scarcity. There was abundance of food for Adam. There was abundance whatever he desired. So is it possible to break free from scarcity? Yes. So three dimensions to scarcity. Number one, scarcity is a curse. Scarcity is a curse. 
Okay? Why did I say that? Because scarcity began with the fall of man. Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, there was no scarcity. It is in Genesis chapter 3, when man sinned against God, that scarcity was introduced into the equation. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. By the way, we have so many scriptures to cover tonight. I'm going to crave indulgence to write as much as you can and to flip, okay, so that we can cover so much ground tonight. Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 to verse 19 says, to Adam, he said, this is God now judging man after he sinned. He said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Before then, the ground was not cursed. So what's the effect of the curse? The Bible says, through painful toil, you will eat all the days of your life. Through painful toil, you will eat all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and tissues for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Verse 19 says, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So if this was the curse, before the curse, Adam did not sweat before he ate. Feeding was not a struggle. Scarcity was foreign to Adam, okay, in the Garden of Eden. So scarcity is a curse. It came with what? With the fall of man. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 to 14. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 to 14. It says, therefore, as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all because all sinned. Pay attention. Let's read it again. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man. How did sin enter? Sin entered through Adam. Okay? Sin entered through Adam. And then death came because of sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Okay, for be, before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Pay attention to this. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did. Sin entered through Adam. Death entered through sin. And the moment sin entered and death entered, everybody that was born by Adam inherited sin, inherited death. And the Bible said that death was in oppression, not because of what you did, but just because you were born of Adam. Did you get that? So the Bible said, now you know the law was given through Moses, and after Moses, judgment came because you broke the law. And he's trying to let us understand, don't think Death was reigning over them because they broke a law. It couldn't have been called sin because there was no law. The fact that there was no law did not mean that death was not in operation. So the Bible said death was in operation from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin. So you need to understand, we are born again. And it's the same way we got into sin that we get born again. We got into sin because of what Adam did. We get born again because of what Jesus did. But my emphasis is on the fact that death reigned over all men, even over those who did not sin. So what is death? Ladies and gentlemen, the calculation of scarcity and sickness is death. You need to understand that. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The introduction of sickness is not for the fun of sickness. Every sickness is calculated to kill. You know, it's amazing we have medical science and it's improved right now. But it will shock you what used to kill people before now. Scurvy used to kill sailors in those days till somebody found out that, look, it's because of a deficiency in vitamin C. That's why you have scurvy. So now we have vitamin C, and so nobody dies of scurvy anymore. Like I would popularly say, what killed Mongo Park? Malaria. Please, you need to understand, sickness is calculated to lead to death. That is the reason why anywhere you find poverty, scarcity, you will find sickness, and life expectancy is always very low. Everywhere in the world you find poverty, you would find out life expectancy, okay, is what is very low. So I decided to check again. As of 2016, life expectancy in Japan, 83.7 years. On average, all things being equal, if you live in Japan, you can grow to 83 normally. 
and nothing will go wrong with you. In the U.S., 79 years. As I'm talking to you right now, the best place to live, highest life expectancy right now is in Monaco. Right now, as a 2018 Monaco. Ghana is 62.4 years. South Africa is 62.9 years. Nigeria is 54.5 years. In other words, according to records, if a 55-year-old dies in Nigeria, it's normal. Why? Because wherever there's poverty, life expectancy is very low. From this record that I'm sharing with you, Nigeria ranked 177 out of 183 countries. Try that for position when you were in primary school. 177 out of 183 countries. Just six above the bottom. Amen? But what's the good news? The good news is that if sin came in, and so sickness and death came through sin, abundance is restored at salvation. And for us as believers, that's the starting point. We entered scarcity because of sin. So the moment you are saved, you need to understand spiritually, scarcity has no place in your life. Now, Romans chapter 5 again, but verse 17 now says, For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. Now, the Bible says that when we are in Christ, we have received God's abundant provision of grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, so that in all things and at all times, you have all that you need, and you have an abundance for every good work. All grace. Now, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17, that we have received God's abundant provision of grace. Hallelujah. And of the gift of righteousness, the Bible says because of it, we reign in life. Last I checked, the people that reign are kings. A translation says we triumph. No wonder John now tells us that whatever is born of God overcomes the world. So please, you need to understand that is the starting point. I break the hold of scarcity because I am in Christ Jesus. Being born again is not about going to heaven and escaping hell. Being born again also has a lot to do with reigning in this life. I thought somebody was going to be excited at that. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 to 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by, being, uh, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Verse 14 says, he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might, com might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. The blessing given to Abraham might come, okay, to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. Why? We were not even included in the covenant of Abraham. Sorry, in the law of Moses. We were not part of Abraham's covenant. We were not part of Moses' covenant. We were not part of David's covenant. The only way we entered the blessing of Abraham is through faith in Christ Jesus. I heard somebody say the other time that the Bible says that we may receive the promise of the Spirit. That the blessing of Abraham was the promise of the Spirit. But if you check your Bible, it says that the blessing given to Abraham may come to the Gentiles. Meaning that the present given to Abraham came to some other people. And Abraham did not receive the Holy Spirit. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, is not the blessing of Abraham. Because if not, you would have told me that people were indwelt by the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. They were not. So Galatians 3.14 is talking about two different things. There is the blessing of Abraham, and then there is the promise of the Spirit. The promise of the Spirit is a New Testament experience. The Old Testament experience was the blessing of Abraham. Are you listening to me? And the Bible says that same blessing of Abraham comes to the Gentiles because now we are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I said I thought you were going to be excited at that. Now that we are in faith, now that we are in Christ Jesus, we are blessed just like Abraham. Would you say with me tonight, because I belong to Jesus, because I am born again, I am blessed just like Abraham. Say it one more time, I am blessed just like Abraham. Say it one more time, I am blessed just like Abraham. Hallelujah. Just like Abraham. So if I were you, I would go back to Genesis from chapter 12. And I will begin to read the life of Abraham. You remember Abraham? 318 men. He went to fight kings and he defeated. Abraham, when things are tough for every other person, Abraham lives in abundance. Why? Because he was what? He was blessed. 
And the Bible says the same thing that was on Abraham is upon you. Hallelujah. In the course of the series, we're still going to talk further about the blessing. So the first thing I want you to understand tonight is that scarcity is a curse. But because you are in Christ Jesus, you have broken the hold of scarcity. Second dimension of scarcity. Scarcity is a mindset. Scarcity is a mindset. In other words, there are people who are poor or who are experiencing scarcity not because of the curse, but because of their mindset. What's a mindset? A habitual or characteristic mental attitude that determines how you will interpret and respond to situations. It's amazing. Everybody listening to me right now, you have a fixed way of thinking. No matter what happens, the, the situations may change. You have a way you respond. This is what I'm trying to let you understand. Some people, when they see opportunities, they feel it's an attack. That's their mindset. And as long as you keep seeing opportunity as an attack, you will never experience the opportunity. You understand what I'm saying? Some people have a mindset. Let me give you an example. When they see powerful cars, their mind is fixed. These cars are expensive. Only thieves buy this kind of cars. Do you understand? It's a mindset. Therefore, because they are not thieves, they will never attract that kind of blessing. They will never operate in that kind of level. You know, some of us, have, I've said this before, when we mention figures, there is a particular figure we get to that you tune off. I'm to everybody. When I say 300, yeah. 250,000, yes. 1 million, yes. Some people checked out there. Six zeros, too much for them. 1.5 million. 25 million. Some people check out there. It's a mindset. Some people, some figures are just not real. It's a mindset. It's a mindset. Do you know that people that have mindsets that look, if you're a Christian, you can't be rich. It's a mindset. The way you think. Okay? The way you think. Let's proceed. I've said this before. Your life travels in the direction of your dominant thoughts. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. It says that be careful how you live. Good news Bible. Be careful how you live. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Your life is shaped not by your prayers. See, essentially what are prayers? Prayers are an expression of thoughts. What is faith? Faith is believing God so much that you act according to his word. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's about thought processing. So this is the challenge. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and the way you think is not in alignment with the word that is coming, you won't be able to receive it, so you won't be able to what? To produce. Hebrews chapter 4, the same gospel that was preached to us was the same gospel that was preached to them. He said, but what they heard did not profit them in that it was not mixed with faith in them that heard. Did you get that? Not everybody hearing what I am preaching right now are benefiting from it. Whether here or watching online, or listening online. Not everybody is benefiting. The state of your mind before the word comes is more important than the depth of the revelation. Remember the parable of the sower? The sower, sower. You know when I read the parable of the sower, as a pastor, I chill. Because that was Jesus. Do you understand? And some people think, ah, if Jesus released a word over me, it will produce results. No. Jesus is potent. It was the same word, but some fell by the wayside. Some fell on rock. Some fell among thorns. Jesus is saying, I am powerful, but I am as powerful as your mind is malleable. I am as powerful as your mindset accommodates the word that is coming. A scarcity mentality a lot of times is a product of past or present experience. That's why you would notice that people who were born to rich parents or people who were born in better economies find it easier to think positively. But this is what I'm trying to say. Don't wave off your experience in a hurry because your experience has a way of molding your mindset. You remember the children of Israel? Think about it. Some of us have not experienced what they experienced in two dimensions. We are quick to talk about the miracles they experienced and then we discountenance what? The suffering of over 400 years. Now you see, the average guy we call children, or you know, the children of Israel. I don't even know why we call them children of Israel. Because they were no kids. Okay? They were born slaves. 
Okay, generations of, this is what I'm trying to say. When you are trying to trace your family line, the oldest person you can trace, slave. When you talk about freedom, it's a foreign mindset. Just like for some people, 35 billion is you know, just high up there. That's the same way freedom was high up there. So even when the, 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 the water of the Nile turned to blood, the frog, okay, the lights, all the plagues of Egypt, the, the parting of the Red Sea, it was not enough to undo their mindset. So that they got into the wilderness and they murmured. You know what they said? They said it is better for us to go back to Egypt than for us to die here. They were not even talking about the land flowing with milk and honey. This is what I'm saying. It's possible for you to have had an experience and you had good news, got halfway into your journey, yet you see, where you are coming from, your experience is stronger than your dream. Your life travels in the direction of your dominant thoughts. So if what happened to you is stronger than the beauty of what is about to happen to you, your life will travel back. They say, let's go back. I, I felt like asking them, please, when you get back to the Red Sea, how are you going to cross? But it's familiar terrain. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your, your, your mind has a way of going back to default setting. Going back to default setting. Going back to default setting. So what happens in Christ is not just your spiritual emancipation. There is something called your regeneration. A transformation of your thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, it's hard work. Are you listening to me? Hard work. You break scarcity mentality through meditation and confession of scripture. And I can teach you this one tonight because that's where I came from. At a point in my life as a student, I think I was in my fourth year or thereabout, studying law. Every time I like to try to look into my future, things were bleak. Because where I was coming from, you know, was tough. So to see how that the future is bright, and this is what the challenge is. When you are that kind of person, it will be difficult to take risks. Because there is no success without risk. But you won't be able to take risks because they will tell you, look, if you go there. It's like the experiment that was carried out. They, they took um, some monkeys put them in a room, there was a shower, and at the top of the shower, okay, they hung a bunch of bananas. So the, the monkeys will try to go get the banana. When the monkey is about to hit the banana, they will turn on the shower. The water will pour on the monkey, the monkey will fall down. The first one tried, there were four monkeys, the first one tried, fell down. Second one tried, fell down. Third one tried, fell down. Fourth one tried, fell down. Guess what? They took away one of the monkeys, brought it a new one that never experienced the shower. When the new one saw the banana, wanted to go for the banana, the remaining tree brought it down. There was no shower, but they dragged it down. If you go up there, you will be showered. Then they took another one, put another new monkey. So two monkeys with the shower experience, two monkeys without the shower experience. The new one wanted to go for the banana, and the other three grabbed it. This one, they never saw the shower, has been convinced by those who have experience. That when you try to touch that banana, something will happen to you. And they did it until all the monkey in the room was not any monkey that experienced the shower. And none of them went for the banana. Why? Because they had been conditioned by experience. Are you listening to me? They have been conditioned by experience. And the mistake we make a lot of times as Christians is that we get born again. You see, it's okay, you can leave Egypt. The question is, has Egypt left you? Do you understand? Somebody has been in jail for like 20 years and then one governor comes and says, I'm declaring, you know, uh, amnesty. And they set all of them free. And the guy suddenly finds himself free. So he's free. But free to do what? He can't go to shop right to buy anything. He gets to the cinema. No money to spend. He goes to look for a job. Nobody wants to give an ex-convict job. Really, he feels... When you set me free, you didn't do me a favor. I read the story of a man in America who went to commit a crime. And they asked him why. He said because the only way he can enjoy his life is to go back to prison. So he went to commit the crime so that he can go back. As far as he was concerned, and think about it, free rent, free food. I'm telling you, you know, American prison system is not like our own here. There's education, there's everything. for The, the guy said, look. My life in prison is better than this one you call freedom. But what? It's what? It's a mindset. So what do you do? You gather scriptures 
I'm going to give you some of those scriptures here tonight. You got, if you want to break the hold of scarcity mentality, you need to understand you are in Christ. Spiritually, scarcity is broken. You are like the children of Israel. You've been taken away from Egypt. You may not be in the promised land, but you are no longer a slave. But now you have to renew your mind. Okay, you confess those scriptures over and over again. You meditate on those scriptures based on where you are coming from. If you have to spend a whole year reading books that explain abundance, I've had to do that. Gather messages that teach abundance and listen to them over and over and over again. So let's look at some of those scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he that gives you what? The power to produce wealth. Psalm 1 and verse 1 to 3. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit with the scornful. But his, lo- his delight is in the law of the Lord. And daring does he what? Meditate day and night. Hallelujah. He is like a tree planted by streams of water. His leaves are not green. He is not afraid of heat. And whatever he does prospers. Hallelujah. Psalm 23, verse 1 to 6. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It makes me to lie down in green pastures. You know it, Abby. Hallelujah. Psalm 34 and verse 10. See, all the scriptures I'm giving you, you will, it's not just, oh, I know them. You will go and write them or print them out and you will recite them to yourself over and over again. Over and over again. Psalm 34 and verse 10. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. You take it a step further, you will not take these scriptures, you will personalize them. Because I seek the Lord, I do not lack any good thing. Good accommodation is a good thing. I do not lack it in the name of Jesus. Food on my table is a good thing. I do not lack it in the name of Jesus. Health all year round is a good thing. I do not. You begin to confess and declare it till you change your neural pathways. Hallelujah. Psalm 37 and verse 25. I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. Hallelujah. Psalm 84 and verse 10. For the Lord God is a son and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he be told from those whose work is blameless. And you need to understand in the New Testament, what makes your work not blameless is not about your work, it's about the work of Jesus. Because in the New Testament, you have what? An abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Hallelujah. Psalm 103 verse 1 to 4. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins. Come on, say all. All. And heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. I like verse 5. Who satisfies your desires with good things. Not with explanation. Hallelujah. God satisfies my desires with good things. And I like the fact the Bible says good things. Because some people can take the revelation and tell you what is not there. Somebody say things. I say things. A phone is a thing. A car is a thing. A ticket is a thing. A visa is a thing. Amen. Uh, an engagement ring is a thing. A wedding is a thing, okay? And the Bible says it satisfies your desires, not with scriptures. Hello? You know where the Bible talks about if your brother is hungry and comes to you, and you just tell him, go, it's well with you, be fed. The Bible says, where's your faith? And some people think that's the way God is. I pray to God about it. I don't even know what God is trying to tell me. Mm, in Christ, his promises are yea. Hallelujah. So, so maybe God is telling you, wait. See, it is, God has said yes before you prayed. But the reason why sometimes there is no manifestation is perhaps there are some things you don't understand. But the problem is not from God. It satisfies my desires. See, these things are truth. The question is, do you believe it? Do you understand? Because there was a land flowing with milk and honey, but the Bible said concerning the children of Israel, they will not enter my rest. Why? Because they did not believe. You know why they didn't believe? What they, were, they had gone through, what they were going through, was more vivid than the promise of God's word. And at every point in time, it's always like that. At every point in time. Let me tell you that. There's never a time God is going to come into your bedroom and convince you beyond all reasonable doubt. It's not in his business to convince you. It is your duty to believe. 
You know, some people are waiting to, that when God will. You know, God will just, God, I'm not even asking, just this once. Just help me. You know, mm. remember that guy came to Jesus, said, I brought my son to your disciples. They couldn't do anything. So you are the boss. He was trying to psych Jesus. You know, you are Jesus. Those guys, they don't even know what they're doing. So that Jesus will use ego to perform miracles. Just said, eh. So he said, if you can't help us. Jesus said, if I can. You know, if you can believe. All things are possible to him that believes. In other words, if you had believed, even my incompetent disciples, you would have experienced the miracle. Oh, did you get that? <laughs> so you say, I brought them, I brought him to your disciples. They could just say, it's not, it's not about my disciples. It's about your faith. Pastor, prove it in scripture. The woman with the issue of blood. I had nothing to do with Jesus. Who touched me? The disciples said, everybody is touching. Said, mm, 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 mm. Somebody touched me differently. Hello? When Jesus was going to tell that one, what did he say? He said, go. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. And that's the reason why we have to labor in Scripture that our mind may align. I preached a message a couple of years back. I titled it, If You Can Change Your Mind. See, because the moment your mind is aligned with the Word, the Word will begin to produce results in your life. Hallelujah. Psalm, we are still, okay, Second Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, the next one. You know, that's my favorite, of course. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. I love it so much. This one, you will read it slowly. Amen? And as you are reading it, you apply it. Since God is able to make all grace abound to you. Second Corinthians 9. Romans 5 already tells you that you have received an abundant provision of grace. So you will skip stage one. Do you understand now? <laughs> God is able to make all grace abound to us. You say, we, we have left that level. We, we have received an abundant provision of grace. So what happens after that? It says, so that in all things, stop there. Somebody say, all things. all things. As in all things. Okay, school fees, house rent, car is faulty, all things. Visa, passport, I want to travel, ticket, all things. Are you getting this? All things. Now, now it's not just all things. It is those all things at all. All times. So it's not that there was abundance we paid first time. And then second time. Oluwa Lambe. No. <laughs> you understand what I'm talking about? All things, at all times, you have some. No, you have all that you need. And then you now have an abundance that you don't touch. You just use it for good works. Oh boy. Hello. Come on, pray in the spirit. Go ahead. Let it sing. Come on. Shandi abo suvle di shte dega basai. Rekata ba ya kando bo zuple teshte di. Listen, listen. Watch me, everybody. If you can't grab all these, all the other ones, take this one, and let it change the way. So when a need comes, don't think will God give me or not. He has made all grace abound towards me, and that grace I have it in abundance. Abundance means excess. I have grace I don't need. <laughs> say God, okay, forget the one I don't need. Even from the one I need, he says all things, all times. I have all that I need, and then I now have abundance, not enough, abundance. In other words, the way I bless people, this, this is what it means. When somebody approaches me and says they are in need, the way I bless them will not fix their need. It will turn them into a rich man. Uh, let me help you understand. There are people who are sending their kids to study abroad. Hello? Now, you know, for a Nigerian to send a child to study abroad, the person must have money. So the person has enough money to send his or her child to study in the university abroad. But guess what? This person is an employee. Somebody is working for somebody. And from the salary he collects, he has enough to send his child abroad. How rich is his boss? Uh -huh. You are the boss. When we talk about abundance for every good work, that look, people that are feeding under me are living large. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm the chairman. My PA is a big boy. Do you understand? That people see my PA, they are overwhelmed. Only for them to find out it's just a PA. So like, what, so what is the boss like? Hallelujah. Listen, that has to happen to you. You now wake up on that your mattress that is almost a mat. You can't call it a mat because it's not. 
But you really can't call it a mattress because the dress is gone. It's the mat that is remaining. You understand now? So it's not a mat, but it used to be a mattress. And then you now wake up in the morning, you will stretch. Mosquitoes will do a capella. And you will say to yourself, I'm not a big boy. I'm the boss of the big boy. Oh, did you get that? I said, did you get that? <laughs> Joseph, Joseph said to the cup bearer, Joseph said to the cup bearer, he said, when you get back to work, he said, mention me to Pharaoh. Joseph, please, who are you? <laughs> Hello? This guy was in jail without trial. So he was not eligible for parole. <laughs> and one very, I said, there was even no record of the fact that Joseph was in prison. They can't trace it. Even if somebody comes to power and they want to declare amnesty, Joseph is not qualified. How dare you have a dream, Joseph? But Joseph said what? Mention me to Pharaoh. You know the reason why? The coat of many colors did something to him. And these scriptures, I'm telling you, that's what they are supposed to do. You meditate in scripture. That's your coat of many colors. So much that after some time, they can take your coat, but they can't touch your mindset. Oh, are you here tonight? And listen to me, that's the hard work, not the hustle. It's not the running around. It is you tabernacling in your bedroom to the point where the word of God comes alive and it colors the way you think. When with that thinking, you begin to talk to men, they will know something is different. When he got to Potiphar's house, Potiphar was not a Christian. Potiphar didn't know God, but Potiphar said, I can sense that everything you taught, there's just something about you. Why? Because the word had become flesh. Are you listening to this? There's something about you. He entered the prison. There's something about you. He said, mention me to Pharaoh. He said, because I was kidnapped. That thinking would affect your talking. People will now tell you, you don't know what you're saying. I said, Joseph, they sold you now. They threw you into one pit and they sold you. They counted it. Ishmaelites brought you. You stood at auction. They said, going, going, gone. Potiphar bought you and paid for you. I said, no, that's not me. I was kidnapped. He didn't say, when you go out, remember me. He didn't say, when you go out, please let me beg Potiphar. I didn't touch his wife. Because you need to understand that the chief cup bearer and Potiphar were mates, were colleagues. He said, Potiphar is not me. Me and Potiphar are not the same level. It's me and Pharaoh that should be talking. What happened after the guy got out? The Bible said the guy forgot him. What did Joseph do? He continued. Only God knows how many people he sent to Pharaoh. The Bible did not record, but if I was Joseph, I would tell everybody, mention me to Pharaoh. Mention me to Pharaoh. Speak about me to Pharaoh. Mention me to Pharaoh. And it was excellent. He had one garment. He had one suit. Somebody said, I'm looking for a job. What are you going to wear on your interview? He had one jacket somewhere. The Bible said when Pharaoh sent for him, he told the guys, give me a minute. The Bible said he changed what he was wearing. Just like blind Bartimaeus. You needed a uniform to beg in those days. When the Bible said, they said to blind Bartimaeus, cheer up, he called it, he threw away that garment. What did that mean? I'm not coming back. Joseph shaved, changed his clothes. He wore something befitting the palace. In other words, I'm not just confessing it. I got ready for this. I'm not coming back. And by the time he stood before Pharaoh, everything was calculated. They say you can interpret dreams. There's a God in heaven. I promoted myself and I got into trouble. I've learned my lessons. I wish I had time tonight. Amen. Where are we? First Timothy chapter 6 verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Watch this. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Ha. It says, if you have change, stop thinking you are the one that produced the change. Because it is God who provides everything for our enjoyment. Is it everything for our edification. God is not just interested in our spiritual maturity. God is interested in our enjoyment. Say enjoyment. enjoyment. Say it one more time, enjoyment. enjoyment. Say it one more time, enjoyment. enjoyment. Some Christians don't use that word a lot. Say it again, enjoyment. enjoyment. God, provides God provides for my enjoyment. For my enjoyment. You know, because you can get carried away by Philippians 4.19. Say, my God shall supply all your need. <laughs> Say transportation is transportation. It's a form of transportation that you are not enjoying. Mm -hmm. So if you, are in, if you have a transportation, you can move from transportation to what? To enjoyment. And the Bible says God does not only provide needs, God also provides for enjoyment. 
Let's round up. Finally tonight, I told you there are three dimensions to scarcity. Scarcity is a curse. By virtue of our salvation in Christ, we have broken that. Scarcity is a mentality. By virtue of confession and meditation in scripture, you can break that. Let's not assume that it's broken. You understand? No push-ups, no biceps. Okay? Finally tonight, poverty is a habit. Scarcity is a habit. What, am I, what do I mean by that? There are behavior patterns that attract poverty. And even when the curse is broken and your mindset is not messed up, there are certain ways that you... I mean, it's like, it's like going to bed at night and leaving your door open. Do you understand? He has given his angels charge over you, but you have invited the enemy. It's like leaving your car running in a public place. Do you understand now? It's like you go to an o one and you take your iPhone 10 and place it on the table while everybody is eating and you walk away. You have behaved in such a way that your phone has no choice but to move. At that point, there's nothing God can do for you. Are you getting this? I'm just going to look at three of them because of time tonight. Number one is laziness. Laziness. You know, for people, some people, laziness is a habit. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 9 to 11. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. Can you get that? See, you cannot be born again and experience scarcity if you don't invite it. But the Bible says how you invite scarcity is not by what you do once. It's a gradual process. There are certain things you do. See, laziness is not just once. It's just little, little things. You yeah, wake up and pray. You don't pray. Everybody is reading a book. You are not reading. Everybody is saving. You are not saving. Or little, little things from mental laziness to physical laziness. The Bible says one day they will just send you your harvest of scarcity. The Bible is trying to let us understand you don't experience scarcity suddenly. That scarcity comes gradually. It's little, and it's always a little Little sleep. It's not a lot of slumber. It's a little. Somebody say a little. Mm, a little can kill you. You can catch cancer not by smoking, but by being in a room with somebody who is smoking. It is called secondary smoke. And if you do it gradually, after some time, that's the way it is. A little sleep. A little slumber. A little folding of the hands to rest. Proverbs 13 and verse 4. The sluggard craves and gets nothing. But the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Not the desires of the righteous. The desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Proverbs 20 and verse 4. A sluggard does not plow in season. So at harvest time, he looks but finds nothing. Unfortunately, he blames the devil. But it's not the devil. It is because he did not do what he was supposed to do what at the right time. Proverbs 28 and verse 19. He who walks his land will have abundant food. But the one who chases fantasies will have his fill of poverty. <laughs> like Bishop Oedipo will say. Okay? Chasing fantasies. There are some people like that. Every time you talk to them, they always have an idea. It's always an idea. You know, the way they're always strategizing. You see, everything is in disguise. Lady, if you have a guy like that in your life, just do everything with him, but don't marry him. I'm going to talk about that a single time out. Guys, no matter how young you are, start doing something. Do you understand? Take all these your ideas, put them on the ground, and start doing something. And stop chasing fantasies. You know what it means to change fantasies? Everything you do is not materializing. Everything is always about the plan. Then I will do this one. Then I will do that one. Then I will do this one. Then I will do that one. I'm planning to do this. I'm planning to do that. I'm planning to do this. Do, just do. Life does not reward you for good intentions. You are rewarded for what you do. October is just four months away. What are you going to do? You've done six months planning. Hello? What are you going to... Listen, you're planning to publish a book. It's okay if by the end of this year all you have done is written an outline. You have done something. 
Do you understand? But that person just chasing fantasies. And there's something about poverty that can make people chase fantasies. In your mind, you know it's not going to come to pass. But you see, fantasies are pleasurable. Say to your neighbor, don't be lazy. Come and tell that person, do something. I'm telling you, do something. Become the PA of somebody. Just do something. I say, the offer, all the offers they are giving me are below me. The question is, where are you? Is there anything below a person on the ground? <laughs> say, all the offers that are coming are below me. I'm waiting for my opportunity. Just do something. David was anointed to be king, but he was doing something. His brother told him, with whom have you left those few sheep? But he went from few sheep to killing Goliath. Hello? His brothers that were in the army, when he was fighting Goliath, what were they, what were they doing? They were doing nothing. The guy that was doing something came on the scene. Look, let's stop talking. Let's do something. It's better to die trying than to live doing nothing. Hallelujah. Tell another person, do something. Let's move because of time. The next habit is selfishness. Selfishness. Habits that attract poverty. Habits that attract scarcity. Selfishness. Proverbs 11 and verse 24. I'm going to read that one from the New Living Translation. It says, give freely and become wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. Verse 25. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. The same verse 24 and verse 25. Okay? Amplified Bible. There is one who generously scatters abroad and yet increases all the more. And there is the one who withholds what is justly due. But it results only in want and poverty. Did you get that? You can be rich and then broke based on what you do with what you have. Did you get that? Sometimes the devil is doing you and a lot of times you are the one doing yourself. You have. But what you do with what you have is the reason why you are broke. Because you have to realize no matter how small, out of what I have, it belongs to somebody else. Do you understand? No matter how small it is, from what I have, it belongs to somebody else. If you eat my own with your own, <laughs> not your neighbor, tell that person, don't try me. <laughs> tell the person, don't eat my own <laughs> with your own. I'm telling you. Hey, don't eat my own with your own. Hallelujah. Look at this. The generous man is a source of blessing and shall be prosperous and enriched. Did you get that? And he who waters will himself be watered, reaping the generosity he has sown. Luke chapter 8 says, the way you bless other people is the way you will be blessed. So if I want to be prosperous, it's very simple. I should be generous. The way I bless others is, see, I, I made it a habit as long as I can do something about it. When I see needs, I want to meet it. Everybody listening to me, would you make, your, make up your mind about this habit? Every time money comes my way, I recognize that everything is not mine. There is he that scatters and yet increases. So if you want to increase, you have to scatter. Hallelujah. Amen. The final one, because of time, mismanagement. Mismanagement. Okay? Mismanagement attracts poverty. Some people, money comes their way, but they treat it anyhow. And you see, money is like a lady. The way you treat it is what determines whether you're going to get a second date, or a third date, or a fourth date. Amen? Some people had the one-night stand with wealth, and that was it. <laughs> they thought they had become rich, but by the following morning, they couldn't find, <laughs> say, where's the money? The Bible says it developed wings and flew away. But when you, want, you tell, when you want to tell money, marry me, and you want money to what? To say yes. You have to be romantic. There's a way you treat money that makes, and it's good management. When you manage money well, it grows. Okay? I'm talking about budgeting, frugality, savings, investments. Those are things you do with money. Proverbs 21, verse 20. It says, in the house of the wise, are stores of choice food and oil. But a foolish man devours all he has. Emphasis on stores, not even store. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know, Robert Kiyosaki gave one beautiful illustration, only for me to find out that a church, even in Lagos, practiced the same thing. He said at a point, his wife wanted a brand new Mercedes, and they could afford it. So he told his wife, 
Let's not spend our money buying a Mercedes. Let other people buy it for us. So they took the money and invested it. And then start, they started saving on the returns on the investment till it was enough to buy the Mercedes. So now they had a brand new Mercedes and the value that they kept was still intact. I said, that's how to spend money. I went for a pastor's training and they were teaching us on management. And the pastor told us, he said, in our church, we have a principle. Everything we buy, we don't pay cash. He said, we will pay you two weeks after you supply. And so it's a big church. He said, for example, we spend over 20 million on diesel. Okay, in a year or thereabout. He said, so what we do is we tell you, supply us. So even though we have the cash, we will now take the money and put it in fixed deposits. So that even by the time we are paying you, at least we've made something out of the money. So we want to buy a generator, so we don't buy it. We take the value of the generator, put it in fixed deposit, then go to the bank and take loan to buy the generator, and then from the interest on the fixed deposit, pay back the interest on the loan till we offset the loan. And at the end of three years or thereabout, we have a generator, we still have our money. What? And you go to the house of the big man, say, see the generator, see the car. See his house. Ah! You know, I met one man at the airport. I said, where do you live? He said, I live in Lekki. I said, oh, big man, you know, we're talking. He said, but let me tell you how it works. He said, how does it work? He said, he said I bought land in Ikorodu. He said, and I built, I built houses in Ikorodu, and I have tenants in my house. He said, what my tenants play, pay me is what I used to pay my rent in Lekki. Not your neighbor, just receive sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? Listen, watch this. There is one character quality that makes it possible. It is called discipline. Delayed gratification. So, forget who saves his help. Let's buy a car. You know the way they will feel on this street when you buy the car. Listen, after you buy the car and you are broke, you really have not bought the car. Do you understand? So we must deliver ourselves from my past, my neighbor's spirit. I want to show them. You know, pepper them gang. Deliver yourself. There is nothing you need that you don't have enough seed inside you to create value for. I'm running ahead of myself, but that's where we are going. Where you will look figures in the face, they can add any zero, and you know it's not beyond me. But it's not because I'm just going to wake up and I'll just see one Ghana must go in my room. No, it's because I have what it takes to create value. So you must be willing to look at yourself and nothing has changed externally, but you know a lot is changing in your mind. A lot is changing in your bank account. A lot is changing in the market. It's only a matter of time. When your harvest comes, they will not see you coming. But you must die to them now. Because they will look down on you. They will talk down at you. They will think you are nobody because you have nothing to show for it. But your show is coming. I said your show is coming. I said your show is coming. I said your show is coming. Show is coming. Yes. Hallelujah. Let's stop it there tonight and continue on Sunday. Let's rise on our feet. Father, we thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes.